I want to understand white rage, and I'm white. Why didn't you stop? Because I didn't feel like it was safe. Well, this is where we ended up. They roll over, give me a EMS started. First of all, on the issue of critical race theory, et cetera, I'll, I'll obviously have to get much smarter on whatever the theory is. Um, but I do think it's important, actually, uh, for those of us in uniform to be open-minded and be widely read. And the United States Military Academy is a university. Uh, and it is important that we train and we understand. Uh, and I, I want to understand white rage. And I'm white. And I want to understand it. So. What is it that caused thousands of people to assault this building and try to overturn the Constitution of the United States of America? What caused that? I want to find that out. I want to maintain an open mind here, and I do want to analyze it. It's important that we understand that because our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Guardians, they come from the American people. So it is important that the leaders, now and in the future, do understand it. 
I've read Mao Zedong. I've read, I've read Karl Marx. I've read Lenin. That doesn't make me a communist. So what is wrong with understanding, having some situational understanding about the country for which we are here to defend? And I personally find it offensive that we are accusing the United States military, our general officers, our commissioned, non-commissioned officers of being, quote, woke or something else because we're studying some theories that are out there. That was started at Harvard Law School years ago, and it proposed that there were laws in the United States, antebellum laws prior to the Civil War, that led to uh, a power differential with African Americans that were three quarters of a human being when this country was formed. And then we had a civil war and emancipation proclamation to change it. And we brought it up to the Civil Rights Act in 1964. It took another 100 years to change that. So look it, I do want to know. And I respect your service and you and I are both Green Berets. But I want to know. And it matters to our military and the discipline and cohesion of this military. In my previous discussions with service members and particularly officers, I would hear about complaints over parts not arriving on time, long deployments, and in my more recent discussions with those officers, the number one issue that they raised to me with concern, often unable to speak publicly for fear of the type of retribution that Lieutenant Colonel Lohmeyer faced, they say that your stand down regarding extremism did not help our military, it hurt the military. And I, I wanna share with you that perspective, that it caused service members to otherize one another, it impaired group cohesion. How should the Department of Defense think about critical race theory? Could I make a comment, uh, Secretary, I'm sorry. Well, I, I'm very limited on my time, General Millis. Well, I, I just wanna make a comment that the feedback well, I know, but I've, I've gotten- I, I, I've asked the question to Secretary Austin. I don't know what the what the issue of critical race theory is and what the relevance here uh, in with the department. We do not teach critical race theory. We don't we don't embrace uh, critical race theory. And I think I think that's a spurious uh, uh, conversation. And so we are focused on extremist behaviors and and not uh, not ideology, not not uh, not people's thoughts, not people's uh, uh, political orientation behaviors is what we're focused on. But and one final point, and thanks for your anecdotal uh, input, but I would say that I have gotten 10 times that amount of input, 50 times that amount of input uh, on the other side that have said, hey, we're, we're, we're glad to have had the ability to have a conversation with ourselves and with our leadership. And that's what we need to and, make and sure again, that we're And again, reclaiming my time, Mr. Secretary, it, it may be that you're receiving that input in the ratios you describe, because it was your directive. I want to be very clear. The military needs to be open to all Americans. Absolutely. That is the strength of the United States military. But once we're in, we bleed green and our skin color is camouflage. We're worried about that American flag on our shoulder. That's the only thing our enemies are worried about. I think we can agree there. But the other thing that they raised to me was a seminar that over 100 cadets attended titled Understanding Whiteness and White Rage taught by a woman who described the Republican Party platform as a platform of white supremacy. This is going on at West Point as we speak to our future military leaders. And sir, I would encourage you, I would demand that you get to the bottom of what is going on in the force and further for what it means for civilian oversight of the military when our future military leaders are being taught that the, fundament, the Constitution and the fundamental civilian institutions of this country are endemically racist, misogynist, and colonialist, and therefore it is their duty to resist them. What does that mean for a future cadet who one day will be sitting where you are? This is not something that uh, the United States military is, is, uh, is embracing and pushing and, and causing people to subscribe to. Now, whether or not this was uh, some sort of uh, critical examination of different theories, I don't know, but we'll we need to understand our past. I want to be very clear, but can you agree at least that understanding whiteness and white rage presented an I call over a hundred cadets probably is something that we shouldn't be teaching uh, our, our future leaders of the United States Army? As you have described it, uh, it certainly sounds like that's something that should not not occur. Again, I would like to know the specifics of, uh, of the Thank you, Mr. Secretary.
I'm Lucas Kuntz, and I'm running for U.S. Senate here in Missouri. You know what? Forget it. I don't have to do this type of thing. You know, I kind of got my fill of carrying one of these around in Iraq and Afghanistan. Stunts like that, those are for those clowns on the other side, like that mansion man Mark McCloskey. If you don't remember who I'm talking about, he's that guy who got his 15 minutes of fame waving one of these weapons of war around at a bunch of people who were walking by his mansion. And now, he somehow thinks that that qualifies himself to be a U.S. Senator. Well, Mark, I hear you got a trial coming up pretty soon here for your misuse of a weapon. So, I've got a challenge for you. How about this? If you do something that you should have done already a long time ago, and that's apologize to all those people you threatened with deadly force, I'll give you one U.S. Marine-led weapons training class. That way, you can keep yourself out of future trouble with the law, and everyone around you will be a whole lot safer. I'm ready whenever you are. And for anyone else who's watching this video, if you think that Mansion Man Mark should take up this challenge and make the world a safer place, go to mansionmanmark.com and sign up. What you saw happen to us could just as easily happen to any of you who are watching from quiet neighborhoods around our country. And that's what we want to speak to you about tonight. That's exactly right. Whether it's the defunding of police, ending cash bail so criminals can be released back out on the streets the same day to riot again, or encouraging anarchy and chaos on our streets, it seems as if the Democrats no longer view the government's job as protecting honest citizens from criminals, but rather protecting criminals from honest citizens. found out something when I was on lunch and I wanted to show it to you. We were talking about Dr. Tenpenny's testimony about magnetic vaccine crystals. So this is what I found out. So I have a key and a bobby pin here. Explain to me why the key sticks to me. It sticks to my neck too. I got this. Yeah, so if somebody can explain this, that would be great. Any questions? sure that I stay at home for our pregnancy test just in case it's negative because I don't want to be forced to grieve in a way that 102 members of this chamber decide it. In 2008, my husband was serving in the Wardak province in Afghanistan with the 101st Airborne. He completed 300 combat missions and his unit was fired upon every single day. During one of those missions, he was shot multiple times, including a gunshot to the lower abdomen. 
the bullet ricocheted off of the magazine on his pistol belt and ended up causing him great harm to his reproductive organs. But he kept serving his country, unaware of the implications he would face later in his life. We got married in 2017, and in 2019, we started trying to conceive our first child. After almost a year of no success, we went in for testing, and we learned that my husband was infertile due to the wounds he received in combat. Our only chance of having a baby would be if we complete it in vitro fertilization, or IVF, as hundreds and thousands of women have to do in our country and in our state. On February 14th, 2020, we started our journey with me getting daily injections every day. After 24 injections over 12 days, nine visits to the doctor for blood work and ultrasounds, and two procedures, we were blessed to have not one, but two fertilized embryos. On February 28th, 2020, we had both of those em embryos transferred into my womb. I was so excited and hopeful at the idea of finally becoming a mother, something I've dreamed about since I was a little girl, like so many other women have dreamed about since they were little girls. On March 13th, 2020, 10 minutes before the governor announced he was shutting down the state due to COVID-19, we received a devastating phone call that my pregnancy test came back negative. I was completely and utterly devastated. Under this proposed legislation, had I learned that my pregnancy failed in the health facility, the facility would be mandated to force me to relive my loss by discussing the need for us to hold a ritual burial or cremation. At a time when I already felt like a failure as a woman and as a wife, I would be forced to relive that trauma, not in a way that I decided, but in a way that 102 members of this chamber decided was appropriate. Now let's fast forward to now. Next week on June 18th, after a year of failed fertility treatments, I'm beginning another round of IVF. I will go through dozens of painful injections, doctor's visits, driving back and forth from Harrisburg in order to do my job, hormonal changes and stress, but all of it will be worth it if we're successful. But now if this legislation passes, my experience will be clouded in fear. If we transfer embryos, I will make sure that I stay at home for our pregnancy test, just in case it's negative, because I don't want to be forced to grieve in a way that 102 members of this chamber decide it. There is also a chance this time around that we could be successful and that we will have embryos left in a lab. We will be forced to pay large sums of money to keep those embryos, even if they may never be used, or to have a ritual burial or cremation. Because this legislation fails to address the difference between a fertilized egg and a viable fetus. This legislation is about taking away a family's choice to grieve and mourn in a way that works for them. This legislation will strip me and my husband from the choice to grieve in a way that we see fit. It will force us to relive Brad's trauma as a combat veteran and the impact that experience has had on our lives over and over again. I really think we, the public understands and they're seeing the proof is in what's happening. It's now projected our economy is going to grow above 7% this year. Projections from, from Wall Street to the Fed 
is it going to continue to grow? We're going to increase more. And guess what? Remember, you're asking me, and I'm not being critical, y'all. I really mean this. It was legitimate questions you're asking me. Asking me, well, you know, guess what? Employers can't find workers. I said, yeah, pay them more. This is an employee's, employee's bargaining chip now. What's happening? They're going to have to compete and start playing hardworking people a decent wage. many Democrats who are looking at this going, this is a great 2024 candidate. Well, then yeah. that's that. I was just going to say that because wasn't wasn't she supposed to be? Yeah, she's supposed to be groomed for Biden this. Biden was the placeholder. Yeah. Well, her. this is what happens when you choose your vice president based on gender and skin color rather than actual talent. to be clear to folks in this region who are thinking about making that dangerous trek to the United States-Mexico border. Do not come. Do not come. The United States will continue to enforce our laws and secure our border. There are legal methods by which migration can and should occur. But we, as one of our priorities, will discourage illegal migration. And I believe if you come to our border, you will be turned back. Well, this is what happens when you choose your vice president based on gender and skin color rather than actual talent and expertise. Oh, I, We're seeing I don't that agree. disaster unfold that's right way, now. That's so mean. Oh, it's uh, mean. She was it's attorney general of the true. state of California. She was a United States senator. You can't uh, demean her just because she. Well, there's her. a reason why she got zero votes and had to drop out of the race before they even started taking votes. question is, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? The list of your political opponents who are dead, prisoned, or jailed is long. Alexei Navalny's organization calls for free and fair elections, an end to corruption. But Russia has outlawed that organization, calling it extremists. And you have now prevented anyone who supports him to run for office. So my question is, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? America just recently had very severe events after well-known events after the, after the killing, the killing of an African-American. And an entire movement developed known as Black Lives Matter. I'm not going to comment on that, but here's what I do want to say. What we saw was disorder, destruction, violations of the law, et cetera. We feel sympathy for the United States of America, but we don't want that to happen on our territory. And we're doing our utmost in order to not allow it to happen. And uh, some fears it has nothing to do with anything. Please. You didn't answer my question, sir. If all of your political opponents are dead in prison, poison, doesn't that send a message that you do not want a fair political fight? As for who is killing whom or throwing whom in jail, people came to the U.S. Congress with political demands. 400 people, over 400 people had criminal charges uh, placed on them. They uh, faced prison sentences of up to 20, maybe even 25 years. They're being called domestic terrorists. They're being accused of a number of other crimes. Uh, 70 of them were arrested right away after the events, and 30 of them are still under arrest. It's unclear on what grounds. 
And as for the, no, nobody from the official authorities has informed us about it. Some people, some people died, and uh, one of the people that died, they were simply shot on the spot by uh, the police, although they were not threatening the police with any weapons. In many countries, the same thing happens that happens in our country. I'd like to stress once more that we sympathize with what happened in the United States, but we have no desire to allow the same thing to happen in our country. agenda pursued by a house by a party that is 100% white in a chamber that is 70% male. Oh, your booze means nothing. Speaker, that's enough. It is not lost on me, and I'm sure it's not lost on many of the members here today, that this legislation is just one more unnecessary overreach in a grossly, predictably, misogynistic agenda, an agenda pursued by a house that, uh, by a party that is 100% white in a chamber that is 70% male. Oh, your booze means nothing. Speaker, that's enough. Your booze mean nothing to me. I've the seen who you suspend. cheer for. The gentleman will suspend. Mr. Speaker. For what purpose does the majority leader rise? I believe these comments are inflammatory to our members and to this esteemed chamber. We have tried to give latitude on this issue, both yesterday and today, but I will not have our members impugned or insulted or this kind of behavior on this floor. Are you not 100% white? The gentleman is out of order. 100% white, 70% male. Mr. Speaker. Turn off his mic. I rise today, obviously, in vehement opposition to House Bill 118. Politicians, uh, legislatures, this particular legislature, a room full of a majority of men, should not be seeking to impose such personal and traumatizing and cruel religious mandates on women and their families in Pennsylvania. Not now and not ever. This legislation flies in the face of the constitutional separation between church and state. This bill not only insensitively targets women and those experiencing miscarriages, ectopic pregnancies, and abortion at a time of extreme vulnerability, it does so by spreading medical misinformation and violating patients' privacy rights. But I want to call attention to something else, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the fact that my colleagues, my Democratic women colleagues, have had to stand up in the House of Representatives, their place of employment, and retell these extremely personal stories of trauma in order to get our colleagues to consider doing the right thing is simply unacceptable. The cost of being a woman legislator in Pennsylvania. The fact that women from my caucus have had to stand up here and share the stories that they could barely share with their own families. Stories of infertility, loss of pregnancy and termination in order to stop the advancement of a bill that will hunt, that will, that will hurt countless more women and families is just wrong. At a time when we should be coming together and discussing how to pull Pennsylvania out of the grips of COVID-19 and invest in our future and invest in women who we know, that we know bore a disproportionate amount of the impact of COVID-19. And instead, we're here focusing on a distraction, debating a bill that will never become law but this feels normal for far too many of us. This is just another act in a political theater that has plagued this chamber for far too long. We are a legislature that has met more to remove mask mandates, strip executive emergency powers, and overturn free and fair elections than we have to make strategic investments in Pennsylvania's women, children, and families. 